The playwright, Robert E. Sherwood, author of Abe Lincoln in Illinois, wrote that the playwright's chief stock in trade is feelings, not facts. This play is set in World War II. The characters of Harry S. Truman, Bess Truman, Henry Stimson, George C. Marshall, and Hideki Tojo were real people, and the decision to use the atomic bomb did occur. However, this play is a work of fiction. The dialogue and actions depicted in this play is a product of the author's imagination and is not a historical record and should be not construed as such. Time, April 12, 1945. Place, a street in anywhere in the United States. Extra, extra, read all about it. President Roosevelt is dead. The president is dead. Let me see that paper. President is dead? Oh, no. What's that? Did you say Roosevelt is dead? Did you hear that? The president's dead. Then who's president now? Hey, lady, did you hear that? Roosevelt's dead. Now who's in charge? I don't know, but we better find out soon. Do you know who's in charge now? In charge of what? Didn't you hear? The president's dead. The president is dead. Scene 1. Date, April 12, 1945. Place, Washington, D.C. An office in the United States Senate building. Harry S. Truman, Vice President of the United States, is seated at a desk reading a newspaper. There's a knock at the door. Come on in. The door is open. Good morning, Donald. What can I do for you? Mr. Vice President, have you heard the news? What news? President Roosevelt is dead. He died this morning. Oh, my. I've also been instructed to inform you that you are wanted at the White House. At the White House? Yes, sir. I have to call this. Sir, there's no time for that. You have to report to the White House now. Ms. Roosevelt wants to speak to you personally. If the First Lady wants to speak with me, it must be about something very important. That may be true, but she was insistent that she speak with you. What could I say to her? Sir, time is of the essence. The press will be there waiting for you. What will I tell the press? Hello. Uh, yes, I heard. Thank you. You're very kind. Uh, please, put me through to my wife. Hello, Bess. So you know. Now I've been summoned to the White House. Thank you, dear. I'm going to need all the help I can get. Okay, Donald, let's go. My name is Agent Delbert O'Neill from the Secret Service, and I'll be escorting you to the White House. Hey, it's a pleasure meeting you. Are you ready, sir? Ah, uh, yes, I am. Let's go. End of scene one. Scene two. Time, one week later. Place, the Oval Office, the White House, Washington, D.C. Truman is sitting behind the desk, reading a newspaper. From off stage comes the sound of knocking at the door. Come on in, the door's open. Ah, Secretary Stimson. Good morning, I'm glad to see you. Thank you, Mr. President, and a good morning to you. Take a seat. Thank you. So, what can I do for you? <coughs> President, the question is, what can I do for you? Yes, I know. I'm still getting used to the idea of being president. President Roosevelt's death was so unexpected, and he was such a great man. Now here I am, a small-town fellow from Missouri, sitting in his chair, in his office. Now I feel like I'm an imposter. Mr. President, let me assure you that you have my full support and that I will continue to serve with your administration as long as my services are desired. Well, that's really appreciated. I just hope I can do justice to this office. Well, we will do just fine, Mr. President, I'm sure of it. Okay, now that we've gotten these pleasantries out of the way, what's on your mind? Mr. President, I want to inform you about a top secret program to develop a new weapon. A new weapon? What new weapon? Well, sir, for the past two years, scientists in Tennessee and Chicago have been working on a project to build a new type of bomb. A new type of bomb? What is it? Come to the point. You've heard of the Manhattan Project? Yes, I have. Does this new bomb have anything to do with the Manhattan Project? Yes, it does. Manhattan Project is the code name for the program to develop and build something called an atomic bomb. Was Congress informed of this? Because I wasn't. Uh, sir, this project was approved by President Roosevelt and... Uh, he never mentioned it to me. 
that is the real purpose of the project. All I knew about the Manhattan Project was that it was some kind of army program to build some kind of advanced weapon. And that's it. And I'm here now, Mr. President, to inform you on the actual nature of this advanced weapon. Go on. I'm all ears. Sir, as I already said, the goal of the project is to build an atomic bomb. What is an atomic bomb? Well, I'm not a scientist or a military man, but I think I can explain what it is. An atomic bomb is a device that will release a huge amount of energy through a chemical process called nuclear fission. Nuclear fission. I never heard of that. Explain it to me. Nuclear fission, if I understand it correctly, is a process whereby atoms, in this case atoms of uranium, are split open, thereby releasing a tremendous amount of energy. The uranium to be split is housed inside the bomb. So the bomb would be fueled by uranium? Yes, sir. Where would we get the uranium? From uranium ore imported from Canada. So the Canadians are in on this project too? No, Mr. President, this is an entirely American project. Has Churchill been informed? Mr. Churchill was informed that we were working on a secret project, but he was not provided details. What about Marshal Stalin? <laughs> Absolutely not. This program is top secret. How powerful is this bomb? Well, nobody knows yet, but it's estimated it could produce a blast strong enough to destroy an entire city. One bomb that could destroy an entire city? That's unbelievable. How much would the bomb weigh? Well, that's a problem that's still being worked on. The actual bomb may weigh several tons, and it still has to be tested. Who else in the government knows about this new bomb? Scientists working on the project, uh, senior army commanders in charge of the project, uh, plus me, of course. So, from what you're telling me, we may be on the way to having a new kind of weapon powered by something called nuclear fission that can destroy an entire city with one blast. That's about the size of it, sir. This could change the way wars are fought. Who needs armies and fleets of planes dropping bombs when one bomb could do the trick? I'm not a military man, sir, but the implications seem obvious. This news couldn't have come at a better time. We could knock the Germans out of the war with one punch. Wait a minute. Have the Germans been working on a new type of bomb, too? According to our intelligence sources, the Germans were working on a similar project. How far along are they? Well, we're not sure, but from papers captured in Strasbourg, France, where they had their laboratories, it seems that they weren't close to building a bomb. That's a relief. But I don't want to take any chances. While the Nazis are still fighting, we can't let them get the bomb first. Hitler having such a weapon would be catastrophic for us. Look at all the damage he's caused with those V-2 rockets. I agree with you wholeheartedly, Mr. President. What was President Roosevelt's plan for using this new bomb? He never discussed that, at least not with me. However, he was in favor of developing such a weapon. I wish I had been informed of this earlier, but I'm glad you informed me now. Between dealing with the Japs and the Nazis, I have my hands full. I feel like a man with a blindfold, feeling his way through a maze in the dark. I know there's a correct path somewhere, but I don't know exactly where. Hey, you understand? Yes, sir, I understand. And we at the War Department are behind you. Okay, keep me informed on the status of this project, especially when the bomb will be scheduled for testing. Yes, Mr. President, I will, and uh, have a good day. Give me General Marshall. Hello, General Marshall. This is President Truman. I'm fine, thank you. Yes, we all miss President Roosevelt. Yes, he was a great man. Well, thank you for your kind words. Do you know anything about us building something called an atomic bomb? You do? Looks like I'm the last one to know. Now, don't worry about it. I'm not faulting you. I just want you to keep me fully informed on how the project is proceeding. Will you do that? Fine. Say hello to your wife for me. You're welcome. <coughs> Sons of bitches. Treating me like I'm a child. Maybe I need to start kicking some butt. And 
Scene 3. Date, May 8, 1945. Place, the Oval Office. President Truman is sitting at his desk reading a newspaper. From offstage comes sound of knocking on the door. My... Mr. President, General Marshall's here to see you. Does he have an appointment? No, sir, but he told me that it was urgent. You know that I normally don't like meeting anyone without an appointment. I know, sir, but he told me that he rushed over to see you about a matter of utmost importance. All right, show him in. You stay. General Marshal, what can I do for you? Mr. President, have you heard the news? So what news? Germany surrendered today. It's official. The war is over. It's about time those sons of bitches surrendered. But the war still isn't over. We still have to deal with the Japs. That's true, Mr. President. But once they learn that the Germans have folded, then maybe they'll follow suit. Yes, maybe. But for some reason, I doubt that. They just seem too big-headed to think clearly. Now that the Germans are out, now we can transfer troops to the Pacific and finish off the Japs. I don't think the American public will be too happy about that. Millions of our soldiers have been away from home for two and even three years. I'm aware of that, Mr. President. But if we send the troops over to the Pacific now, then we'll bring this war to a rapid conclusion. You think so? Don't look to me like the Japs are ready to quit. How many men have we lost so far at Okinawa? Quite a lot, but all within acceptable limits, Mr. President. Acceptable limits? That sounds good on paper, but not to the families who've lost a son or a daughter or a brother or a father. We're at the verge of winning. It's just a matter of time. But when? No matter how much damage we inflict on them, the Japs won't stop fighting. You know anything about these kamikazes? Yes, Mr. President. They're Jap suicide bombers. Do you think that an enemy willing to kill themselves is likely to surrender? They can throw all the kamikazes they want at us. That won't stop us from winning. I know that, General. The problem is that our casualty figures are increasing rapidly, which is giving me a lot of cause for concern. But if the Japs think that they're going to bleed us until we throw in the towel, they have something else coming to them. I'll tell you that right now. Mr. President, let me state this categorically. We are not going to lose this war. Who said anything about losing? But the war can't go on indefinitely. I have to think about the American people, and right now, I can't tell them where the war will end, and that's a problem. Then that is why we need to transfer the troops from Europe to the Pacific as soon as possible. Have you not understood anything I've said? The people are getting tired of the war. It's costing us a lot of lives. We need to get this war finished quickly. By the way, if we do reduce the number of troops in Europe, what will the Russians do? I presume they will abide by their agreements made at Yalta. But still, how can I be certain that the Russians won't try to grab all of Germany? The Russians took heavy losses at Berlin, so they're probably in no shape to pick a fight with us. The same thing is being said about the Japs at Okinawa. Yet we're still fighting there. And for what? I don't quite understand your question, Mr. President. Why are we fighting with the Japs in the first place? Because the Japs attacked us at Pearl Harbor, Mr. President. Don't sass me, General. I have no patience for that. Sir, please accept my apology, but I did not mean to offend. You posed a question to me, and I replied. Well, I didn't like the tone of your reply. Then with all due respect, sir, could you kindly explain what it is you're driving at? <sighs> Look, General, it's like this. Remember when the Japs started the war with China in 1937? Of course, sir. Well, everybody got on the Japs, including us. But what I can never understand is why we were so hot and bothered over the Japs going into China in the first place. Probably because the Japs were flagrantly violating the open door policy. Yes, I know that, General. I'm not completely ignorant. But was that enough of a reason for us to want to risk a war with the Japs? I would say yes. And that's because? Because the United States had vital interests in China and the Pacific, which had to be defended. What vital interests? Mr. President, I'm a military man, not a diplomat. 
And the issues you are raising are a bit outside of my area of authority or expertise. I'm just trying to make heads and tails of why we got into this war in the first place. Sometimes I think it would have been better if we'd have left the Japs alone and let them deal with China. You know, let China become their problem and save ourselves a lot of grief, such as Pearl Harbor, Wake Island, and Bataan. Mr. President, what you are talking about is called appeasement. Neville Chamberlain tried that with Hitler and it did not work. And there is no reason to believe it would have worked with the Japanese. The Japs were bent on conquest and would not listen to reason. Well said, General. But still, I have to find some way of explaining to all those mothers out there why their sons are still dying on the battlefield. Let me assure you, Mr. President, that you have my full support. And once again, thank you for meeting me on such short notice. Thank you too, General, for informing me of that new weapon. My pleasure, Mr. President. Boy, what a stuffed shirt he is. I wouldn't want him as my company commander back in the first war. Do me a favor, will you? Yes, sir. Could you please arrange to have the kitchen deliver a ham and cheese sandwich on white bread to the Oval Office? Of course, sir. Is there anything else you may need? No, that's it for now. And you've seen great. Scene four. Time one week later, 11 p.m. <coughs> Place. A bar located a few blocks away from the White House. The lights are dim. Behind the bar, behind the bar is a bartender. Sitting at the bar is a middle-aged man named Sal Di Martino, who's sipping on a drink. Nearby are President Truman and Donald, who are dressed in cognito as factory workers. Sir, I don't think it was a good idea to come here. If the Secret Service finds out, they'll have a fit. Let me worry about the Secret Service. What will it be, gents? Nothing for me. Oh, don't listen to him. Two beers. Okay, but well, two beers coming up. Any gents mind if I turn on the radio and light up the place a little? That's a good idea, my good man. Okay, fellas, here's your beers. That'll be four bits. I'll pay for it, sir. No, no, I'll take care of it. Truman takes out five quarters from his jacket pocket and places them on the counter. That fifth quarter is for you. <laughs> Thanks. Every little bit helps. <laughs> you get it? <laughs> Every little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good joke. <laughs> very funny. Don't you think that's funny? Uh, yes, sir. Very funny. The bartender walks over to the radio and turns it on. Light orchestral music can be heard. Sir, I really think we shouldn't even get back to the White House before they find out you're missing. Stop worrying. But Mr. President... Don't call me Mr. President here. The last thing I need is for anyone to find out who I am. This is the only way I can make real contact with the people. Find out what's really on their minds, and what's really bugging them. I can't do that from the Oval Office, or while parading around in my official capacity. You understand? I do, Miss... I mean, sir. But what will your wife say when she finds out you're gone? Not to worry. My wife is a sound sleeper. Whatever you say, sir. Good. Well, stop pestering me and drink your beer. The President and Donald start sipping on their beers. An attractive young lady named Grace enters the bar. She glances around the bar and approaches Truman. Why, hello, gentlemen. Mind if I join you? Please do. There's plenty of seats. Grace sits next to Truman. Could you buy a lady a drink? Of course. What will you have? Lots in common. My good sir. The lady would like a vodka and tonic. Why, thank you. What's your name? My name's Harry. What's yours? Grace. <laughs> That's a lovely name. And you look like a very sweet girl. That will be 50 cents. Truman hands the bartender a one dollar bill. Keep the change. Thanks, Mac. My, you're quite a big spender. Thank you, my dear. But let me assure you that I do not spend money needlessly. We understand the value of money where I come from. And where's that? Missouri. Have you ever been there? No. The furthest I've ever traveled was to Akron, Ohio to attend my Abu's funeral. And that was a bust. The old fuddy dud left me out of her will. Oh, that must have been disappointing. It was, but what was I to do? And it was only through the help of my friends that I was able to get back to Washington. Well, you must have good friends. None of my friends are worth a dime. <laughs> yes, they were good friends. A nice young lady like you should have good friends. Truman, Donald, and Grace sip on their drinks. What are you doing out so late? 
I, I couldn't sleep, so I thought I'd go for a walk and maybe meet somebody nice, you know? Make a friend. Well, I think you came to the right place. I think I did too. Grace puts her hand on Truman's. Truman pats her hand. What kind of work do you do? I'm a secretary, but right now I'm looking for another job. Do you hear that? Grace here is a secretary and needs a job. Do we need a secretary? I don't know, sir, but I can find out. Good. Find out. Tell me more about yourself. I'm originally from Baltimore. The music from the radio is interrupted for the news. And here's this evening's top stories. Fighting continues to rage on Okinawa as the Japanese continue to put up stiff resistance. According to sources of the battle, the Japs have gone all out to push our soldiers off the island and continue attacking our ships with fleets of suicide planes called kamikaze. Losses on both sides have been high. Turn that damn thing off! Hey, take it easy. Don't need to yell. I'm turning it off. Sorry, man. My son's in Okinawa, and that report upset me. Hey, that's rough. I don't know if he's alive or what. You know, Harry, the world's in a real mess. I know, dear. When will this damn war end? And that's what a lot of people are wondering. Roosevelt would have known what to do, but that new guy Truman is doing nothing. What good is he? Since he's become president, we've lost more soldiers than during the entire previous two years. I thought the Japs were ready to surrender. What the hell is going on? I think he's upset with the president. I know that too, dear. Well, I think it's about time for us to be going. Well, will I see you again? I have a feeling you will. And please, give me your address where I can reach you. Grace takes out a pen from her pocketbook and writes her address on a napkin and gives it to Truman. Here's where you can find me. Grace gives the napkin to Truman, who then gives it to Donald. Time to leave. Donald and Truman get up from their stools and are leaving. Before exiting, Truman goes over to the man at the bar. I hope your son comes through it safe and sound. He's serving his country, and for that, you should be proud. Thanks, Mac. What's your name? Sal. Sal DiMartino. Yours? I'm Harry. Pleased to meet you. Take care. Unnoticed by the others, Truman and Donald are exiting. But right before they go off stage, Truman signals Donald to stop. From off to the side, both stop, turn around, and watch the action on stage. You know, that guy looked kind of familiar. You know, now that you mention it, he did. Nah, no way. <laughs> nah, you're right, couldn't have been. Hey, mister, you want some company? Get lost, whore. That's right, Cramp. Scram. Hey, I didn't mean it like that. I heard what you said about your son, and my kid brother's been missing in action since April, and if we don't get word about him soon, I don't know what we'll do. He's only 19. Grace starts crying. Sal gets off his stool, goes over to Grace, and hugs her. Grace continues to cry on Sal's shoulder. Truman and Donald saw and heard everything. I've heard enough. Let's go. And also, Make sure you contact Grace first thing tomorrow and offer her a job, preferably on the White House staff so Mrs. Truman can look in on her. And if she refuses, you go to her home and tell her that she is directed to report to the White House by order of the President of the United States. We can't have young women going around crying. Yes, Mr. President. End of scene four. Intermission. <laughs>